Lucy and I thought this would be an important and a timely topic for this year's conference when we started planning last August, as our world last year just so dramatically changed. And we wondered what, would, what does virtual healthcare look like for people with developmental disabilities? How has that impacted healthcare? Uh, today, I'm gonna to be bringing the clinician's perspective on uh, virtual healthcare for, for our population. And Jennifer is going to uh, join me at the end to talk for her part, to talk the community and the patient of voice and perspective. I have no financial disclosures, but I do have to disclose that I am not a tech expert, as you may have discovered from this morning when I couldn't even get my audio to turn on. Uh, but I have to say in my defense, I did have a power outage last night uh, and my computer was updating this morning. So uh, when I was thinking about I, that, I thought it's kind of ironic that I'm talking about virtual anything when I can't even get online. But, but seriously, it also made me think about perhaps some of the barriers and the issues that, that our population faces as well when they are trying to um, when they are trying to access us as healthcare providers virtually. Um, as Lucy mentioned, I've been in primary care for over 35 years in a general medicine practice. It's a traditional office-based practice at UCSF and probably a third to a half of my patients are adults with developmental disabilities. Many of them live independently in the community or with family um, and are supported either by uh, independent living support staff or caregivers. So it's kind of that perspective that I'm bringing to the, this discussion today. So telemedicine, the new frontier in healthcare, well, it's not really new because telemedicine actually was around for quite some time, but it wasn't in, uh, in widespread use. Uh, it was really viewed as an alternative to in-person care um, and sometimes thought of as not as good as in-person care, not as good quality, uh, but did have certainly served a purpose for people who lived in rural communities uh, who did not have access, uh, easy access to healthcare. So what, what is telemedicine or telehealth? Um, basically, it's technology-enabled healthcare services. And that can be through the telephone, through secure email, sometimes remote monitoring programs. There are, there are programs in existence to help patients monitor hypertension, uh, heart failure, diabetes, uh, sometimes with smartphone apps or other kind of um, applications. Uh, video visits have become very plentiful this, this, over this past year, and I'm gonna focus a lot of discussion about them. But video visits and they video visits will require certain equipment, just like you got onto the conference today uh, through Zoom. It requires that you have a computer or a phone or a tablet. It requires you have good internet services uh, and good broadband. Um, and for people with disabilities, it oftentimes requires that they have someone to help them, you know, get online uh, and or or be there with them during the visit be it a caregiver, a staff member, um, family member. Sometimes, of course, we have interpreters and, and having accessible equipment so that uh, the equipment um, matches up with what their uh, capabilities and what their needs are. So the impact of COVID-19, uh, shelter in place occurred um, a year ago. Uh, and all of a sudden there were no in-person routine visits. The emergency rooms were still open, but of course people were afraid to actually go there. Um, and we, would, we discouraged people from going uh, to any, initially to any kind of emergency room and urgent care setting unless it was truly emergent. Because of this, there was a rapid expansion. I'm talking overnight almost of video visits in outpatient care. I had never done a vis video visit uh, prior to um, last year, uh, uh, March 16th was my last in-person clinic with my two students. And then two days later, I had a video visit. So I had to learn how to do this as so many of us did uh, last year very, very quickly. Why were we allowed to actually uh, open up to uh, video visits and virtual healthcare uh, in such a widespread fashion? 
Well, the reason for that actually is that payment regulations changed. I didn't realize this, but in trying to do some research for putting this talk together, um, I've learned a, a few things about telemedicine and uh, telemedicine apparently has been traditionally regulated at the state level and that every state has different rules and regulations. So what might be covered in South Carolina will not be covered in Arkansas um, and vice versa. And so the rules have, have been varied and also confusing and, and not easy. So with the, with the COVID-19 and the shutdown, um, within weeks, hundreds of these state and federal rules were changed. Medicare, which is uh, sort of the lead horse in our health insurers um, prior to the pandemic, less than 1% of Medicare visits were conducted through telemedicine. Um, but now 50%, this is primary care visits, 50% of primary care visits are done uh, virtually. And Medicare um, had very strict rules for uh, the use of telemedicine prior to uh, last year. Um, and they expanded coverage for phone, email, um, video, um, healthcare services. And it is thought that not all of these um, regulations uh, that will continue uh, to, in terms of their change format, but uh, the, the notion is that many of them will. So I thought this was interesting. This was a survey of 118,000 adults in the United States that were 18 years and older. And uh, they did this survey from December, 2019 to May of 2020. And the, the orange dotted line is uh, individuals who, had, who were not planning on using any telemedicine. And you can see in December of 20. 19, it was a very high percentage. And that percentage by May was almost cut in half, as opposed to this blue line of people, of individuals who had used telemedicine services less than 10%. And by May, um, it was approaching 30%. So dramatic changes in the population's perception of telemedicine. What about outpatient care delivery? So this was a, a very large study that was done looking at Medicare and commercial um, databases um, of 16.7 million uh, patients seen between January 1st of 2020 and June 16th. Um, and you can see the, these are the total visits. Uh, the telemedicine visits are in orange, and this line here represents in person. So majority of visits uh, up until week 11 is when the shutdown occurred. Majority of visits were in person, but as soon as that shutdown occurred, you can see um, that the in-person visits dramatically dropped, and there was a very, very fast and quick um, uptick of telemedicine visits, outpatient visits. So I wanted to think about, well, what does this mean? How much telemedicine we're doing? What, what about uh, the, the three issues of access, quality, and patient satisfaction um, as, it, um, as it impacts our population of people with disabilities? And this is a quote that, um, that I got from a, a great webinar that AADMD uh, sponsored earlier this month from Holly Tabor uh, at Stanford uh, on ethical issues and inclusive healthcare for patients with IDD during COVID. And so two things that she said really resonated. And one was that patients with disabilities have baked in inequities, not, not surprising, not new information per se. Um, and that telemedicine magnifies that disparity gap in healthcare for people with disabilities. So increases the inequities in care delivery. So is this true? Is there, does telehealth magnify this disparity gap or in some instances, does it actually help improve care? So issues with access. Um, one of the things I think that's very interesting about access is the environment. So when one has a virtual visit, 
the environment is actually really controlled by the individual. The individual is most often at home or in a, um, a location certainly of their choosing and they have individuals with them uh, of their choosing as opposed to needing to wait on transportation which sometimes doesn't even show up, uh, needing to be in a crowded waiting room that may not be uh, uh, very good for individuals who have any kind of sensory issues or who have, uh, has anxiety. Um, so the, the environment I think is, is it's interesting that there's some definite advantages um, to having telemedicine visits uh, in an environment that has some control by the individual. And I'll just bring, uh, to me, it, 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 um, it's actually bringing healthcare uh, to the individual, sort of like a home visit, as opposed to the individual coming in for healthcare. And, and there is a, there's sort of a nice sense about that. I have had uh, the occasion of seeing this um, sort of a case example here of a, a young man with autism who also had a severe anxiety disorder, um, an intellectual disability and a uh, very impulsive uh, behavior disorder. And the last time I saw him in the office, um, he, his visit went a little too long and he ended up totally bolting out of the office and running out of the practice, out into the, uh, actually out to the uh, outside of the building with his mother chasing him. Clearly that was not a very successful in-person visit, but this year I actually saw him uh, with a virtual video visit uh, on the ranch that he lives at in Sonora. And um, he was able to participate in the visit with the staff member, he stayed for the entire time. Um, and I was able to do, I think, a very, um, uh, a very successful visit, uh, sort of a check-in on his diabetes and his other couple of other issues uh, through virtual care. I've also had the opportunity to do visits for um, individuals from their car because that was the best place for them to be uh, uh, for this particular uh, visit. And actually that, surprisingly, that went okay to two individuals with intellectual disability and their mother. Um, and it's great for the clinician to be able to, to see the home environment, to see um, uh, what, uh, what's in the home environment, how organized it is, how safe it might look, how clean, who's there to support the person. So I think there's some definite pluses to that, but you have to, ha you have to be able to connect. You've got to have that good broadband internet. You've got to have uh, hardware that's up to date. Um, and then you have to have the supports there with you. So sometimes uh, caregivers um, or uh, supported living staff will actually bring their own tablets or equipment there so that they can help um, hook up with the, with the individual. Appointment availability. Um, so as we now change to a hybrid of video visits and in-person visits, um, that means that in-person visit availability is, gonna, is, is lowered. So I have 50% of my visits by video, 50% in person. My in-person clinics are always chuck full. My video clinic visits are, are, or sessions are not always full. Um, and I think that that is telling in terms of the fact that some individuals really do need to be seen in person. And I'm concerned that uh, these hybrid models will impact um, and delay care for people who actually uh, need to be seen in person. And what about preventive and routine care? We know it's been delayed this year. There was an interesting blip on the news last night uh, from the National Cancer Institute saying uh, that um, there was such severe pandemic related delays in cancer screening that their prediction was um, that there would be increased breast and colorectal cancer deaths uh, by nearly increase of nearly 10,000 over the next decade that could have been prevented by routine screening. I think we have to really be mindful of that. So what about quality? Um, probably the biggest issue with quality of care with virtual visits is the inability to do a physical exam. So we've gotten creative uh, with caregivers and others who are with the individual on a video visit, uh, learning how to do, help do a musculoskeletal exam, certainly looking at the skin, um, sometimes doing, helping to do a neurologic exam but it's really not ideal. One of the references on this slide is a nice article 
uh, that was written about some of the ethics in telehealth and the role of care partners. Uh, that I think we have to ask ourselves a question, are we putting them sometimes in a uh, position where they're uncomfortable? They're either uncomfortable with um, some of the information being discussed, or maybe they're uncomfortable with helping with those pieces of the physical exam. Um, are they uncomfortable? Is the, is the patient or the client uncomfortable with uh, disclosure of sensitive information? Um, and have we actually, have we gotten, are we sure we've gotten consent from the patient in terms of that? Um, home monitoring equipment, when an individual has home monitoring equipment at home, it certainly increases the quality of the visit. Blood pressure cuffs, O2 sats, temperatures, thermometers, uh, a scale. Uh, without some of the home monitoring and glucomet yeah, glucometers, without some of those home monitoring equipment, the, the visit is certainly not as robust as, a, as an in-person visit. Um, several speakers have mentioned appropriate communication and patient education tools. Uh, we both in person as well as virtually, I think that we're still lagging behind and having um, appropriate tools that, that look at this, the, the literacy and the um, ability of the individual to actually absorb that information. Uh, what about the ADA? Now the ADA, as we all know, um, that has been uh, in regulation for many, many years, and it addresses the physical access issues um, for individuals with disabilities. Uh, the ADA was signed into law before the internet became such a, a widespread tool. Um, so uh, it, the ADA is, 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 is in law, is, in, is a legal document. Um, and I think that's important because as we move towards more virtual care, <clears throat> we don't have any laws that actually uh, mandate um, accessibility and quality uh, for healthcare for individuals with disabilities outside of the ADA. So we've really got to have some movement on the policy front and the um, regulatory front about web accessibility and virtual care in order to really look at quality. Patient satisfaction. Mm. So um, in the literature, there's not a huge amount about patient satisfaction, but the studies that I looked at, uh, many patients and clinicians thought that, that video visits and virtual care uh, was great. Uh, reasons cited, it's convenient, it's time efficient, uh, there's lower cost, you, know, you don't have to put uh, money into transportation, you save time. Um, most of the studies focused on simple issues like simple urgent care problems or stable chronic disease management, pre-op visits, follow-up visits. Um, and they noted that um, some of the areas to improve um, uh, video visits and virtual care was better online appointment scheduling and better, better communication of what are the next steps after the visit. But I found nothing published, um, no published data on people with disabilities in terms of patient satisfaction. And it made me say, um, you know, we really need to do, we really need to survey um, our, our patients now uh, to ask them about this, because I think video visits definitely are here to stay. So just to kind of wrap up, what might the future look like? Um, now that we know that there's going to be probably more uh, virtual health care as part of our mainstream, it really presents an opportunity for, um, for us as healthcare providers, as community, as, as advocates and, um, and uh, others to look at improving access and quality through, through technology for our population. Um, this is um, uh, something that I found in, the, uh, in my research. It's an international group from Poland and Germany, and they're looking at starting a multi-center study uh, to examine the use of a, of a multi-modal telemedicine application uh, adapted to the, the health needs and capabilities of, indi of individuals with DD. And I think this is in the behavioral health realm, but, realm, but uh, I thought it was great that they were, were going to start a project. And I think this is where 
this is where we need to be is to start some pilot projects to see how we can um, make this a better service for our population of people with developmental disabilities. So on that vein, I am gonna turn this over to my partner, uh, Jennifer, who is uh, gonna tell us about um, the community perspective. Today, I'm going to be talking about uh, the telehealth experience of the ARCS health advocates and their participants. And I think what you'll find is um, it echoes a lot of what the, the issues that the jury has just spoken about. So I have no disclosures. For a little context, health advocacy is the ARCS health case management program, uh, which was developed to promote um, better outcomes for high-risk adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Our program has nine health advocates that currently support 126 participants. And prior to uh, the pandemic, uh, nearly 100% of the appointments that we supported were in-person appointments. With the onset of COVID, uh, the program quickly pivoted to a hybrid model where we we're supporting both telehealth, which included both uh, video and audio only appointments, as well as in-person appointments. And since about mid-March of last year through the end of February this year, 40% of the appointments attended were telehealth appointments, and that was roughly 290 appointments uh, that we supported. And through these appointments uh, and conversations and observations with the health advocates and their participants, they, they identified benefits uh, of the telehealth system as well as challenges. So first I'm gonna share uh, the positive, the benefits. <clears throat> um, it really did, uh, both parties felt that it, it really increased uh, access for a lot of individuals. Uh, we did note that there were fewer participant driven cancellations with our telehealth appointments versus in-person appointments. And there are a couple of reasons given for this. Uh, transportation, I know that's come up a few times. Um, and while our program does provide transportation to the individuals we serve, the time associated with that transportation, which could be given parking and to and from and traffic could easily add an hour plus on either end of an appointment time. For those who don't have that kind of transportation support, not having to, um, navigate public transportation, not needing to schedule uh, sometimes difficult to obtain paratransit rides, or even particularly in the time of COVID to feel safer, use uh, expensive ride shares, really um, eliminated both a disincentive and a barrier for many people to accessing healthcare. Um, like Jerry mentioned, waiting rooms can be really challenging environments for a lot of individuals. They can be chaotic, they can be loud, they can be bright. And for those who already have, uh, you know, sensory sensitivities and maybe uh, experiencing apprehension about seeing their provider, um, eliminating that component, also the long wait sometimes associated with being in the waiting room really did help um, mitigate that issue and again, make healthcare more accessible for individuals. One thing that participants and, and health advocates felt was that it was easier to access providers for some smaller aspects of healthcare, like uh, getting prescriptions refilled or getting test results or even just some basic management of chronic conditions. And where that really became important uh, were for some of our individuals because of the shelter in place orders who were feeling uh, very isolated and also a lot of anxiety. And because of that, to have that touch point with a provider who they often had, you know, long-standing trusting relationships with really made a difference and helped um, ease some of those concerns. Uh, some of just felt like there was better communication with their providers. They were more easy, easily able to participate in the appointment. And um, that could be just because of the built-in distance that comes with a video appointment or an audio appointment. Um, and also, uh, both for the health advocates and the participants, uh, again, due to the, uh, the, the lack of need for transportation, the time saved by not having the waiting room times, there was really more time to focus on the appointment outcomes and directives. So what needed to happen outside of uh, the appointment to help support either maintenance of health or improving health. And a lot of that had to do maybe with some lifestyle changes, um, you know, diet, 
exercise, um, and also a lot of mental health and behavioral support. So I want to give a quick example of uh, a person who telehealth worked really well for. We support a young woman who is very tech savvy, has her smartphone, and she uses it to connect with her friends and with our program. Um, and she also uh, uses a motorized wheelchair for uh, mobility. The family does have a van, but her primary caregiver is also the caregiver for uh, several other dependents in the family. So recently uh, she developed a flare up of a chronic skin condition that she had. Um, and instead of having to go through all uh, the details and the time, uh, and the planning for an appointment, she was just able to connect with the help of her health advocate with her provider via, provider via video um, who could see what was going on and uh, call on a prescription so that she could get treated. So it was a much easier process for that person. Um, so those, that's a lot of the, the benefits, but of course there are uh, challenges as well associated with the telehealth. And one of the big, biggest uh, challenges was technology. We already knew prior to COVID that there was a digital divide. There is a digital divide for people with disabilities uh, and technology. And again, like so many other things, COVID just really highlighted that divide. So many of the persons that we serve have uh, no access to internet or limited access to internet. They don't have the devices, they don't have smartphones, they don't necessarily have um, the uh, uh, tablets. And they also lack the digital literacy, even if they do have some of that technology. Um, some people do have support uh, to help them, but as was pointed out previously, um, you know, a lot of people lost support during the pandemic. Um, and even for those who live with family members, a lot of the people we serve live with aging caregivers who also lack that digital literacy. The health advocacy team was able to bring their own devices to individuals to support that, um, to support health, particularly virtual healthcare appointments. But again, we're a small service that really doesn't serve that many people and it's not necessarily accessible to everyone. Um, some of the areas where we saw a lot of challenges was uh, the impact that telehealth had on communication and connection during the appointments. One of the biggest issues brought up was the difficulty that a lot of participants had remaining engaged in the appointment process. Um, challenges with hearing and understanding what the provider was saying, maintaining eye contact, um, not really knowing when to uh, when it was time to listen versus when it was time to answer questions. Uh, but also uh, with folks who are in their home environment, which was much more comfortable, sometimes there were also a lot of distractions. So there were TVs on that were, uh, you know, where focus was being uh, put and then, you know, other people at home were distracting. Uh, as, and some, we have one example where individual was just so disengaged that they fell asleep during the appointment. Some participants expressed that they felt that telehealth was less than care, uh, meaning that they didn't see their provider in person. If they weren't getting that physical exam, they really did not even see the point of having an appointment. During COVID, I think one of the key pieces in all this is the fact that so many of our participants are much more isolated with the stay uh, the shelter in place orders. So as Sheridan mentioned, a lot of programs pivoted very quickly to providing remote services. Um, so people that, and not everybody, again, back to the technology, um, was able to receive really uh, good remote service provision. So for people that we normally would see day to day at the day program, uh, or people who normally, let's say have a job coach and they went furloughed during COVID, um, those were daily eyes on. Um, and for, for individuals who had more difficulty recognizing or uh, articulating changes in their health, those outside eyes on were really critical in identifying maybe changes that were happening in the person that could, they could talk to the individual about and, and make sure that there was a way to, that their provider knew about that. Well, that system has kind of been put on hold. Uh, and so not having the ability for the provider to even have that in-person uh, assess, the ability to do the in-person assessment really uh, puts up a lot of concerns for, uh, for the fact that health issues may get overlooked. 
And then some individuals reported that they had less privacy at home, whether they were in a board and care situation um, or even in a family home, and that they didn't want to maybe talk about more personal health issues. And I think uh, the follow on from that, that, that again, a red flag that is it possible that people might not be then disclosing issues of neglect and abuse or just other problems that are happening at home, particularly in situations where the caregivers are there with them, uh, supporting them in the appointment. So an example uh, quickly of a person who telehealth was not the best choice for is, we support a woman who lives with aging caregivers who have competing health issues. Uh, this woman uh, needs support to be able to articulate uh, what, how she's feeling physically and emotionally. Um, so parents participate in the appointments. Parents also benefit from having a language interpreter uh, as part of the appointment. <clears throat> There's no technology in this family, so they are really audio only appointments. So in, in order to have a telehealth appointment, there are five people on the line, including the health advocate, the provider, the interpreter, um, and then parent and participant. So you, as you can imagine, it's very challenging to have an, a, a successful and effective appointment under those circumstances. But um, there's still opportunity to improve telehealth for people with IDD. Um, you know, uh, and one of the biggest ways we can do this is really investing investing in uh, digital literacy skills and access to uh, uh, internet and devices. The ARC has already um, been doing this for a couple of years with grants from Price Waterhouse Cooper and Department uh, or Disability and Aging Services San Francisco, where we're funded to uh, provide both individual and group support for teaching. Uh, basic all the way to advanced computer skills, as well as accessing, uh, accessing devices. And it's really important because we know digital uh, equity and literacy really is the gateway to connection and independence and now really health access as well. But we really need this to be person-centered so that the technology that continues to be developed needs to be accessible um, and appropriately matched individuals. There's no one size fits all solution as far as um, technology goes. And probably one of the best ways to do this is by practicing inclusive innovation where people with IDD and their circles of support are seen as strategic uh, partners in the ongoing development of telehealth, uh, the development of telehealth technology. Um, and it's probably one of the best ways to ensure a level playing field uh, for healthcare access for people with uh, developmental disabilities. Thank you. Anyone has any more interest in health, learning about health advocacy, you can always contact me. Thanks.